بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله and welcome to this podcast series of a commentary on نهج البلاغة by Mizan Institute ثم جمع سبحانه من حزن الأرض وسهلها وعذبها وسبخها تربة سنها بالماء حتى خلصت ولاطها بالبلة حتى لزبت فجبل منها صورة ذات أحناء ووصول وأعضاء وفصول So after Imam Ali alayhi salam in this first khutbah he speaks of the four types and categories of angels that Allah has created he moves on to the creation of Adam alayhi salam and this is going to be in five stages number one the creation of Adam both from a physical and material perspective his body and the soul that was blown into him and then number two stage number two is about the is the whole story of the prostration of the angels to, to Adam and how Iblis turned away from that and rejected that stage number three is Adam alayhi salam in heaven or in that garden we'll talk about that later and what happened there and how he was regretful of the disobedience he exhibited now once again we'll have to talk about that whether it was disobedience was it uh, a sin what was it exactly and stage number four speaks about how the children of adam they spread and uh, they grew in numbers to the point where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala feels that it is now time to send prophets with divine books for the guidance of the people so that they can uh, attain spiritual perfection and secure their afterlives through that. And the final stage of this part of the khutbah um, that has to do with Adam alayhi salam has to do with the people and descendants of Adam during the time of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. How Allah sees that the people have reached a point where they're now, they are now ready for the final prophet and the seal of prophethood through Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and some of the details there. So let us begin with this first stage um, of Prophet Adam's creation and that is his physical body that was created before it even had a soul in it. So it says, ثُمَّ جَمَعَ سُبْحَانَهُ مِنْ حَزْنِ الْأَرْضِ وَسَهْلِهَا And so Allah collected and I'm going to read mostly off of the um, translation that we have in English of uh, Nahj al because I felt that you know it has done a good job here. Uh, as, as you have noticed probably, those of you, those of you who follow this podcast, um, sometimes I will not agree with certain parts of the tra- English translation. Other times I'll feel that you know the translation has done a good job. So here in this part, I feel that it's done a pretty good job. So most of it, I'll be using that English translation. But of course, with some of the commentary and explanations that I feel are needed. So it says that Allah, what He did was He collected from hard, soft, sweet and sour earth. Okay, Sweet and sour are not that there's parts of the earth that if you, if you eat the sand of or the soil of, it's going to taste sweet like sugary. <laughs> no, sweet here meaning neutral, I would say. Sweet here meaning not something that's sour and salty versus the other parts and other lands of this earth that actually are salty and have a, if you were to taste it, it's it has that salty taste to it for different reasons. Okay, so it says Allah created from, He collected hard, soft, sweet, and sour earth. Collected that dust, that dirt. And so what did He make out of it? Sannaha bil ma. What he did was he he dripped water on it till it became pure. Sannaha um, means to pour water on something. Now here the translation says dripped in water, um, or maybe it means dipped in water. The English, but what is meant according to the Arabic, sannaha bil ma means that he uh, either dipped it in water or poured water over it. Okay, so he did all of this. Hatta khalasat one, it became pure. I did not find in any of the uh, commentaries of Nahj al um, I looked at maybe two or three. I didn't find anything that uh, explains what is meant here by becoming pure. I'm guessing that maybe there were some uh, there were some components in that soil that Allah had collected 
that were impurities, and so those needed to be washed away first. Something like that comes to mind. And so he washes it, Allah washes this earth or this dirt so that the impurities go and it becomes pure. Hatta khalasat. Khalasat, you know, we say khalis, something that's pure, we say khalis to it. Khalasat is the verb of that. Wa la taha bil ballati hatta lazabat. What else did he do? He kneaded it with moisture till it became gluey and sticky. Okay, so it's becoming like that potting clay that, you know, these people who make pots, clay pots, um, what they use, that matter is what he's trying to, it seems, achieve here. A gluey, sticky, clay, and muddy type substance that you can use to mold and knead and uh, make whatever you want out of it. Okay, so he did all of this. Now, someone might ask, why use hard, soft, sweet, and sour earth? Just take you know, dust from one place or, or soil from one place, place and mix it with water and, you know, use this mixture and clay to make whatever you want to make. Why from different types of earth? Here, um, some Mufassirin of Nahjul Balagha, they've said something I felt was good. They said that uh, the reason why God has used different soil, not just one type of soil, is so that this individual has different talents and potentialities and that different people can come into existence that are different in every way so that societies and civilizations can come, come into the picture and, and come about. Um, if you were to have people that are all exactly the same, then that would not really um, help. Uh, when you have people, so one person likes to do certain things, another one likes to do other things. These people come together, they all have different talents, they have different things that they're good at, and so they can serve each other, help each other, and out of that comes socialization and interaction and all of that. And that's where God can test everyone. Okay, If everyone was identical and carbon copy of each other, that would not be possible. So I think this is a I think that this is a good point that is pointed out here by some of our mufassirin that this is actually showing us that God was after this. He's after diversity. And if God is the one after diversity and we'll talk about this more later. I mean it comes up again later as well. If God is after diversity and he's embracing it then us people there's no room for us when it comes to racism and all of that to have any of that because God has wanted us to be in different colors and shapes and of different talents and so on. Okay, so Allah has this initial clay that He wants to build something with. He wants to mold something with. So what did He do? It says, from it He carved an image فَجَبَلَ مِنْهَا سُورَةً ذَاتَ أَحْنَاءٍ وَوُصُولٍ وَأَعْضَاءٍ وَفُصُولٍ He carved an image with curves, joints, limbs, and segments, it says here. I think that's good. So this is not just some little round object or thing that God created. No, it has all these complexities to it and details to it. It has curves and joints and limbs and segments. So as you all know, as we all know, all of this for what purpose? Because this body is to survive in a world that we live in, this earth that we are uh, inhabitants of. And so if we're going to live on this, we're going to have to be able to satisfy the needs that we have, address those needs that we are created with. How are we to do that? If we were just some round object, we wouldn't be able to get anything done. But now that we have all these joints and limbs and segments and all of that, each of these is going to serve a purpose so that life can be sustained on this earth. So once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has now molded us the way He likes. He has carved an image out with all those curves and joints. Now it's time for this clay that seemingly is still moist and wet for, for it to dry now, to take that shape on and become that which it's supposed to become. So it says, أَجْمَدَهَا حَتَّى اسْتَمْسَكَتْ وَأَسْلَدَهَا حَتَّى صَلْصَلَتْ he solidified it till it dried up. And it dries up to the point where hatta salsalat. Salsalat, um, we have this also in the Quran. It says that inna khalaqad khalaqna al insana min salsalin min hama in masnoon. This is Surah Hijr, 
verse uh, number 26, that we created uh, mankind from a salsal. Salsal, they say, means uh, when you know when clay dries up to the point where even if wind blows at it, it makes this like hollow sound, something like that. So he let it completely dry, okay? And then what happens after that? لِوَقْتٍ مَعْدُودٍ وَأَجَلٍ مَعْلُومٍ He let this happen for a period of time, a known duration and a fixed time. He let this happen for a while, okay? Why? Well, someone might ask, well, doesn't God just snap his fingers as if? Doesn't he just say, kun fayakun, and something will come into existence? No, no. When matter comes into the picture, the rules and laws that govern matter will also be there. That's how God has created matter. And that is one of the qualities of matter, time. And so time has to pass for these things to happen, apparently. Now, once again, there the, the details of this, we don't know exactly. Okay, Imam Ali here in, in this khutbah is giving us a, a picture that we can look at and get an idea of how things are working. But exa- the exact details of this, yeah, we don't know exactly. Is it all of this literal? Is the sum of it metaphorical? Um, how much time did it take and all of that? These are things that we won't know the details of exactly, but we have an idea of how, what our origins are, where, where, where it all began for us. Okay, so it says he left it for a while. It was for a fixed time and a known duration. Now here, commentators, they've explained uh, with a hadith that we have that this time took about 40 years. Okay, so we have a hadith. It's fam- This is a famous story by Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam where he says that yes, this time period was 40 years. And so, so to speak, in a corner, Allah had put this project of his, so to speak, in a corner after it was done for it to dry and get ready. And so it says the angels would pass by this and they'd see that lump of clay or that clay being in that corner and they would ask themselves, what is this? What's going on? It says in Arabic, فَبَقِيَ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةً مُلْقَى تَمُرُّ بِهِ الْمَلَائِكَةً فَتَقُولَ why was this thing created? For 40 years, they would pass by this, the, the angels would pass by it, and they would ask themselves, or ask each other maybe, what is the point of this? What is this for? What has it been created for? Um, so I find that pretty interesting, that even the angels, they don't know what's going on. And after everything is, is taken care of, then they also don't understand why they have to do, why they have to prostrate to this being. And what is... And what is it exactly that this being is going to accomplish that no other being that God has created is able to? So this part of the khutbah had to do with the physical uh, and material creation of Adam. But that is not what constitutes the human being in its entirety. The human being is a combination of physical body and soul. And that is that combination is what we call al-insan. And so the khutbah will go on and we'll cover this in our next episode, uh, we'll go on to discuss the actual blowing of the soul into Adam, making him an actual insan. And there are some, there are a few points that we need to discuss there as well. For now though, there's one point here that we need to discuss, and that is, judging from what this part of the khutbah is saying, it is very clearly implying a, crea- a creationistic worldview and perspective of our existence, that we came into existence through creationism. What does that mean? That means it's not that we slowly, 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 that the human being slowly, slowly evolved from another species of animals, from apes or monkeys or whatever have you. It It's clearly saying that God, from zero, from scratch, created man and mankind directly from dust, from dirt, and clay. Okay, Now, this is what this literature is telling us. We also have this in the Qur'an. The Qur'an is pretty clear about how this is the case as well. But I want to say this, that there are differences of opinion here regarding this matter. Um, And it's a very, very tough subject, I'm going to tell you. It's a very tough subject to tackle and decipher, um, to figure out what, what exactly our origins are, and how even evolution can be refuted um, based on the literature that we have, based on the hadiths that we have. We have some hadiths 
in Shia and Sunni sources, and then we have some hadiths just in Shia sources about beings by the name of Nasnas and the details there and so on. But that itself is like a whole different discussion and requires its own research. I do know that um, one of the Mizan instructors, uh, Sister Fatima Megji, she has done a very extensive research on this and has a long paper, or you can even call that maybe a book, if I'm not mistaken, 70 to 80 pages on this. Um, the Shi'i perspective of uh, the our origins and Prophet Adam and his origination and creation and the beings that were there before us and the beings, uh, other beings that might be out there. So I would highly recommend that brothers and sisters who are interested, there will be um, a a dedicated podcast and ebook on that book of hers that Mizan Institute will also be offering. Um, it hasn't come out yet, but it will it will be coming out very soon. For those of you who are listening to this right now um, on this day of in this year twenty twenty two, but if you're listening to this way later, then uh, it's probably already out and you can access that as well if you want more details in that regard. Okay, so that is the physical creation of Adam. We will also we will inshallah move on to the uh, other dimension of Adam's creation, which is the ruh and soul of his, in our next episode. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.